Robert Morsley is one of the longest serving prisoners in the UK and considered one of the most dangerous. For the last 44 years, Morsley has been in solitary confinement, 39 of these in a purpose-built glass cage underneath H&P Wakefield, one of the most high security prisons in the country, where he's not allowed contact with any other prisoners, and during the one hour he is allowed out each day, is escorted by at least four to six prison officers. The reason for this is that Morsley is a serial killer who has killed four people, three of them in prison. Welcome to Evil Among Us. Robert Maudsley was born on the 26th of June 1953 in Liverpool, UK. He was one of 12 children with their father being a lorry driver, also called Robert, and his wife Jean. It appears that Maudsley's home life was hellish, and when he was 21 months old, he and some of his siblings were taken into care due to parental neglect. Maudsley and his siblings spent time in an orphanage being cared for by nuns, and it appears that this was the only period of stability in his life. During this time, unlike other children, Maudsley did not receive visits from his parents, and in some respects this was probably a good thing, as it gave him some distance from the abuse he had suffered. Unfortunately, at age eight, Maudsley was returned to the family home and continued to be abused by his father. One of his siblings later stated, quote, It was just the old fella who hit us with his fists, belt, and sometimes a stick, but our ma instigated half of it. Maudsley himself said, quote, All I remember of my childhood is the beatings. Once I was locked in a room for six months and my father only opened the door to come in and beat me four or six times a day. It appears that Maudsley was singled out from his siblings for the worst of the abuse, and he claimed this included being sexually abused by his father. Maudsley alone was then taken back into care, with his parents telling his siblings that he was dead, so essentially cutting him off from any support. In around 1969, at age 16, Maudsley went to London and drifted around the city. He developed a drug habit and attempted suicide on numerous occasions, ending up in various psychiatric facilities where he expressed thoughts of killing his parents. In order to fund his drug habit, Maudsley committed some offences, but also worked as a rent boy, exchanging money for his sexual services. It was when working as a rent boy in 1974 that Morsley met his first victim, a labourer called John Farrell, in Wood Green in North London. On March the 14th, 1974, Farrell engaged the services of Maudsley, and after they'd had sex, Morsley claimed that Farrell showed him pictures of children he'd abused. Morsley then took a length of cord and strangled Farrell to death. Morsley surrendered himself to police, admitted what he'd done, and told them that he needed psychiatric care. Morsley was found unfit to stand trial and, at the age of 21, was instead sent to Broadmoor. Broadmoor, or to give it its full name Broadmoor Hospital, is, as the name suggests, actually run by the National Health Service and its role, like other psychiatric units, is to treat the mentally ill. However, Broadmoor is a high security facility due to only admitting the most dangerous types of individuals who pose the gravest threat to themselves or others. Due to this, Broadmoor's 284 beds are mainly occupied by people who have come from prison, the courts or police stations, having either been convicted or awaiting trial for or arrested for extremely serious offences. On very rare occasions, Broadmoor admits people who have not committed any crimes yet, but are considered a danger of committing serious offences imminently. As it is a hospital, residents are known as patients, and the average stay at Broadmoor is five years, although some residents can spend the rest of their lives there. Once deemed well enough, the patient can then be transferred out, whether this be back to prison or to stand trial, etc. Although it's a hospital, Broadmoor's level of security is in line with a maximum security prison, including anti-escape measures, including rows of fencing, security cameras and a 20-foot surrounding wall. Anyway, also a resident in Broadmoor with Maudsley was David Cheeseman, a man with a history of violence, including attempting to murder a worker at another high-security psychiatric facility by hitting them over the head with a metal bar. Another patient was David Allen Francis, a convicted child molester. On the 26th of February 1977, when Maudsley was 23 years old, he and Francis played football whilst Cheeseman watched. After the game, Cheeseman asked a male nurse to open a door where they could change out of their football boots and the three of them went inside. When the nurse went to follow them inside, Maudsley pushed the door closed and Cheeseman barricaded the door with a footlocker. The pair then tied up Francis and proceeded to assault and torture him over the next nine hours before finally strangling him to death. Morsley had armed himself with a sharpened spoon and he rammed this into Francis' ears so hard it went into his brain. When they had finally killed him, Francis' body was held up and displayed to hospital staff who were able to peek in but not enter. 
Eventually, Morsley and Cheeseman let them in to a sight of absolute horror. Francis' head had been, quote, split open, exposing his brain, which had the sharpened spoon stuck in it. Whilst this murder was horrific enough, there was a rumour that the spoon found in Francis' head was due to Morsley trying to eat his brain, which then, through Chinese whispers, turned to the fact that he had in fact done this and consumed other parts of Francis' body. However, this has been proven incorrect, but didn't stop Morsley being dubbed the, quote, British Hannibal Lecter after the famous antagonist of the Science of the Lambs book and film. Curiously, whilst found unfit to stand trial after the first murder, Morsley was considered competent to stand trial for the murder of Francis and was convicted before being sent to Wakefield Maximum Security Prison in West Yorkshire, dubbed the Monster Mansion, due to the number of high-risk sexual and violent offenders who were held there. On the afternoon of July the 29th, 1978, Maudsley, now 25 years old, killed two prisoners in the space of an hour in Wakefield Prison. Maudsley later stated that he intended to kill seven people that day. The first victim was a man named Salmony Darwood, who was serving a life sentence for murdering his wife. Maudsley apparently knew Darwood for some time, as Darwood was teaching him French. Maudsley advised him into his cell, and then attacked him, stabbing and hacking at him with a makeshift dagger and strangling him. Morsley then hid the body under the bed in his cell. Morsley then tried to lure other prisoners into the cell, but none of them would enter, so he went out looking for another victim. He's described as, quote, lurking on the prison wing when he came across William Roberts, a man serving a sentence for sexually assaulting a seven-year-old girl who was lying on the bed in his cell. Morsley attacked Robert, hacking him with the same dagger and smashing his head against the wall until he was dead. Morsley then calmly walked up to a prison officer, dropped the bloody weapon on the table and told them that they would be too short at the next roll call. During his hearing for this double murder in 1979, the court heard that during his crimes, Morsley believed his victims were his parents. The killings, his lawyers argued, were the result of pent-up aggression resulting from a childhood of near-constant abuse, with them stating that Morsley had said, quote, When I kill, I think I have my parents in mind. Morsley also apparently said, quote, if I killed my parents in 1970, none of these people need have died. Morsley was returned to Wakefield Prison and kept in solitary confinement and, as his picture shows, his movements outside of his cell were shadowed by prison officers. He gave one interview where the only pictures of him are taken from and again, as you can see from this picture, he's surrounded by prison staff. In 1983, Morsley was deemed to be too high a risk to other prisoners it was decided he needed to be permanently housed away from them, so a separate prison cell was built in the basement of Wakefield Prison, essentially a prison within a prison. There are no pictures of this cell, but it's described as being 18 foot by 15 foot, or 5.5 metres by 4.6 metres, with the walls being made of bulletproof glass so it can be observed from all angles. Within the cell itself is a table and chair, both made out of compressed cardboard, with the bed being a slab of concrete, and a toilet and sink which are bolted to the floor. In order to actually get to the area where he's housed, requires going through multiple security doors. Once at the cell, there's essentially an airlock which has to be gone through in order to stand face to face with Maudsley, being separated by more bulletproof glass, with there being a slot through which his meals and other items are passed to him. Maudsley is watched by officers 24 hours a day. He is allowed out of his cell once a day, but is escorted to an exercise yard by between four to six prison officers. This cell is described as closely resembling that of Hannibal Lecter in the film The Science of the Lambs, but Morsley's current accommodation was built eight years before this film was released. The combination of the layout of Morsley's cell and previous erroneous reports about him eating part of his victims has continued to fuel the perception of him as being the British Hannibal Lecter. However, Thomas Harris, the author of the books, has never stated the character or his prison cell was inspired in any way by Morsley. Robert Morsley is now 69 years old has spent the last 44 years in solitary confinement, 39 of these in his specially constructed cell, where he will remain until the end of his life. I want to preface this part of the video by saying that overall I don't support solitary confinement. It's obviously an extreme measure which causes significant emotional and psychological harm and is sometimes used as a way to simply torment others. An example is the recent unrest in Myanmar with politicians held in these conditions after the military coup in 2021. However, I'm struggling not to think that in some cases there's little other choice when it comes to extremely dangerous offenders. 
Maudsley's prolonged solitary confinement has been in the news on and off over the years, including in the year 2000, when Maudsley petitioned the courts for a relaxation of his conditions or, if this was refused, access to lethal drugs to end his life. At the same time, Maudsley was in correspondence with a journalist from the Times newspaper and wrote the following letter, quote, How did I find myself in permanent solitary confinement at Wakefield? I first killed a man outside and found myself in Broadmoor. I then killed a fellow patient at Broadmoor and eventually found my way to Wakefield, where I killed two fellow inmates. It's on my record that I served numerous periods of solitary confinement at Broadmoor prior to killing a fellow patient. It's also on my record that I underwent a long period of solitary confinement in various prisons prior to my arrival at Wakefield and placement on normal location. At no time in Broadmoor or those prisons did I receive any kind of psychological or psychiatric assistance or help. Numerous national newspapers and tabloids have labelled me Britain's own Hannibal Lecter, etc. All very sensational, no doubt, and I've received numerous letters from people over the years who have watched this film, Science of the Lambs, and who believe it's a genuine portrayal of my life story. They are, of course, entitled to their beliefs. However, a more accurate portrayal would be a film called Murder in the First. I mention this because an important question for these people to ask would be to what extent my conditions and environment and treatment at Broadmoor and H.P. Wakefield played in causing me to react in such a savage manner. As you know, I don't see any psychologists nor any psychiatrists currently. It seems Wakefield is happy to place me in permanent solitary confinement after killing two of its prisoners. Actually, all Wakefield has sought to do since 1978 is to demonise me. He also wrote, quote, Do we all not form our opinions, beliefs, etc. from how we perceive that environment? Wakefield prison authorities perceive me as a problem, their solution to that problem to date has been in effect to bury me alive. The cage ultimately for them being my concrete coffin. But is that the final solution? What purpose is being served by keeping me locked up 23 hours a day? Why even bother to feed me and to give me one hour's exercise a day, month and year, yet not allow me to talk to any other inmates via their windows? Who am I actually a risk to? Let me try to briefly answer that by saying I killed rapists, paedophiles and sex offenders. No other type of person nor other type of offender so my past crime strongly suggests this is the group most and solely at risk. Why is this? I can say that yes, I've been raped, and yes, I've been sexually abused by such people, and consequently, I do detest these people enough to have killed them in the past. I have no previous convictions for killing prison officers, and I have no previous convictions for seriously wounding nor stabbing any prison officers, and I cannot perceive nor can I imagine any situation in which this would arise. Morsley also told the reporter that he'd asked the courts for a budgie, and that he would take care of it and, quote, not eat it. The Times article I read from this time is very sympathetic to Morsley and his living conditions, and the apparent inhumanity of his situation. I looked online at various message boards and comments in response to this article, and other articles about Morsley and his living situation, and there seem to be a lot of people who perceive him as a hero, with them stating the only killed child sex offender saw what's the problem. These also seem to be mixed with general anti-establishment messages, including this one from 2000, which I found particularly odd, to say the least. This comment describes Maudsley as, quote, a truly superior, insightful, brilliant, soul-alive philosopher. It goes further by stating, quote, I honour Robert's choice to speak out to the media and condemn the brutalisation, the inhumanity, with which he has been treated. 46-year-old Robert is one of only 26 UK prison inmates who have been sentenced to life in prison with no chance of ever being released. Now Robert is demanding to be treated as a human being or else he says he'd rather be murdered by the state. All he wants is to be treated as any human being in the 21st century deserves, at the very least. His voice, as published in the letter excerpts, is a cry of sanity in an insane society. In a sane society, a million people in England would rise up as one, together, and demand this tortured child victim, who has been unjustly tormented by society for his entire life, be finally treated as a victim, a victim worthy of limitless apology, affection, understanding, support, and only benevolent, never punitive treatment. It continues, quote, I honour your master, Robert. If there was any justice in the world, you would have a thermonuclear bomb capable of destroying all of humanity in your hands with the launch codes, and you yourself would be asked to decide whether the human race deserves to continue to exist. You're entitled to make this decision, Robert. You alone, based upon the unforgivable lifetime of unjust torment that your society initiated against you when you were a baby, has inflicted and continues to inflict upon you. Okay, that's an extreme example. 
but I think it illustrates my overall point that I think Morsley's case has been romanticised to make him out to be some sort of vigilante who only targeted child sex offenders rather than a vicious, dangerous killer. Whilst Morsley claimed that his first victim showed him images of sexual abuse and that's why he killed him, and two of his other four victims were sex offenders, one, Stanley Darwood, was in prison for murder and Morsley seemed to have no problem with interacting with him before that to learn French. This doesn't fit the pattern and strikes me as something personal. Also, Morsley was described as, quote, prowling the wing looking for other people to kill. I think it's difficult not to conclude that he was simply looking for anyone to kill and came across William Roberts, killing him simply because he was in his cell and available, rather than potentially anything to do with his offending. So, whilst it's clear that Morsley has an understandable hatred of sex offenders, I think that potentially he was just wanting to kill as many people as possible for his own reasons, potentially because of the rage towards his parents and society, due to the fact that he felt victimised and abandoned. I don't believe that Maudsley did what he did to make society a better place. His actions are far more self-centred and selfish. Perhaps because of our natural revulsion of those who harm children, it's been twisted into something more poetic than it is. The question is really, would you trust Maudsley around your family? Was Maudsley failed by society? Quite possibly. However, while sympathetic to this, many people have horrific upbringings, but they don't then use this to justify taking the lives of others. Morsley had opportunities to be within the general population in custody, but he used this to murder not one, not two, but three people. I know the tone of his letter was to try and plead his case and highlight the injustice of his situation, but I can't help but note the self-justification in his words, blaming others for his actions and appearing to link the conditions in Broadmoor and Wakefield directly to his criminality. However, it's a circular argument. He apparently blames Wakefield for him committing the offences, but feels aggrieved that they took issue with the fact that he then murdered two inmates, so he blames them for what happened and then blames them for the outcome. He states that Wakefield considers him a, quote, problem. Well, yes, because you killed other prisoners. Ultimately, I'm not sure what Morsley expects. To be taken at his word that he would only kill certain types of people and therefore should be allowed out in the general population? How the prison service would even manage this is unclear. They would have to basically vet any prisoner who came anywhere near Maudsley to check their criminal record. However, what about someone he simply thinks is a child molester? Would he then kill them? Stripping away all the other details, Robert Maudsley killed four people, and therefore he's clearly a man who likes killing others for whatever reason, and who, because of this, the prison service had to build a specialist cell just for him and surround him with guards whenever he leaves it. In terms of being a martyr and tortured, it's clear that his basic needs are being met. He's sheltered and fed and is allowed out of his cell. The only thing missing is company, and Morsley has ensured that's not possible due to killing those around him. However, it should be noted he does have visits from family members. To illustrate the continued danger of this man, more recently, in 2022, there was some publicity about letters Morsley had written to his nephew, in which he seems to have come to terms with being in solitary confinement, where he apparently spends his time playing video games, but he also disclosed that, if he was ever released, he would kill again. I'm really interested in your thoughts on this case. What's your perception of Robert Morsley? What's your position on him being in solitary confinement for so long? Do you think it's justified? Do you think his story has been twisted to be more palatable than the facts suggest? Do you think he should be released back into the general prison population? I look forward to reading your comments and welcome opinions other than my own. That's the only way we learn. Please like and subscribe and I'll see you in the next video.